All right, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. My name is Hallie. I'm a member of the quad education team. I want to welcome you all to our webinar on getting into an Ivy League. We have two of our fantastic college admissions counselors here with us tonight who are going to walk us through this. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of you who are either in the midst of your applications right now or planning for your applications next year. And hopefully we can give you a little bit of information to help you on your path to an Ivy League or um, you know, an Ivy Plus school as well. Um, for those of you that don't know, Quad Education is an admissions consulting company, and we work with students and families through their entire college education, college application process. Um, we help from like starting late middle school, early high school with choosing extracurriculars and classes, taking standardized tests all the way through, um, filling out your application, writing your personal statement, choosing what schools to apply to through the full end of that process. Um, and so with that, we'll dive right in. So tonight, I'll have our panelists introduce themselves. We'll give you a little background on themselves. We'll talk about what Ivy League schools are looking for in general. We'll talk about how to tailor your application strategy. Um, make sure you are giving, you're putting your best self forward. We'll talk about choosing activities and displaying academic excellence. We'll give you some tips on how to elevate your application. Then we'll open things up for a Q&A. All right, so we have Jennifer and Marina here with us today. Jennifer, can you introduce yourself for us? Absolutely, glad to be with you all today. Uh, my name is Jennifer and I've been with Quad for several years now. And prior to that was um, directing college guidance program at an independent school in Maryland where I also coordinated the IB curriculum. Prior, I uh, got my undergraduate degree from Harvard in English and East Asian studies, studied abroad for my graduate program in Japan, and then um, worked as an academic advisor uh, and directed study abroad programs at a wide range of institutions in the US. Thanks so much for being here, Jennifer. Always a pleasure to have you. Marina, can you introduce yourself for us? Sure thing. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Marina. Um, I am also an admissions counselor with Quad, and I graduated from the University of Pennsylvania um, for undergrad, where I did the warden program. Um, also studied abroad, so it's always fun to hear about like all the cool study abroad programs and um, what you did, Jennifer, as well. And um, then I went into management consulting and um, shifted over to uh, marketing roles. I lived abroad for a couple of years in Argentina, then um, went to get my um, master's, um, an MBA at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business and um, transitioned into brand management. And um, now I'm in kind of the field of research. Um, so that's something I really enjoy at, um, speaking with students as they're starting on this path, um, which is super exciting. Great. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here as well. All right. So let's dive in and talk about what Ivy League schools are looking for. Um, Jennifer, you want to start us off here? Certainly. Absolutely. Um, so as you're thinking ahead, um, whether you're a senior who's getting your REA or ED applications ready, or you might just be beginning your high school career, and wondering how you need to shape uh, your trajectory over the coming years. These are some of the key points to keep in mind. Um, and they're, it, it's a long list. Um, it can be a little bit overwhelming if you're just starting out, but we want to encourage you that um, with the right guidance, you can really develop a holistic application um, for the Ivy Leagues that will be a compelling read. Um, some of the key qualities that we've noted here, academic excellence. So that's defined in a couple of ways. Um, the schools are looking for course rigor, not just straight A's. And um, they wanna see that of the available coursework at your institution or even beyond your institution for secondary education that you have made the most of the curriculum that's available to you. And that looks like specializing in your chosen area of study and making sure that you're taking all the relevant advanced courses um, at your institution. Then you also wanna be paying attention to standardized testing scores 
while schools are still test optional in this year. Um, we're not sure how that's going to unfold in the future. There's a lot of debate about it. And um, it is still used as a metric for many institutions. So you want to be paying attention to that as well. They're looking to evaluate your extracurricular activities. And in within that category, you're going to be asked to show that you have extracurriculars that map to your chosen area of study. And so you want to be focusing in and developing a real kind of expertise or a niche where you feel that you can really shine in that area of focus. And you also want to be paying attention to opportunities for developing leadership. Um, that can be becoming a leader of an existing organization, either at your school or in your community. And it might also mean founding, um, initiating a, an organization that matches with a cause uh, that you're very passionate about. So you want to be mindful that, again, here you're looking for depth, not necessarily that you're trying to do everything and be great at a whole bunch of different things, but really to develop a few key areas that you're specializing in and focusing in. Then they're also going to be looking at personal qualities and character. You have numerous opportunities in your essays to um, demonstrate those qualities and those characters. Uh, characteristics and your references will also be asked to comment on those as well. Again, um, you're going to be asked to see like how can you contribute to the campus community with diversity uh, and with your unique perspective that you bring. And um, you may be asked even to do an interview. There are um, some schools that offer those as alumni interviewers. Um, are you know spread throughout the country and throughout the world and may be available to talk with you. Um, I did that alumni interviewing for Harvard and Stanford does so as well. Many of the, the schools do offer that. Um, and so you need to be prepared to have a, an in-depth conversation about yourself with an alum from the school and sometimes even with a representative from the school's admission team. Fantastic. Um, Marina, anything else to add here? Um, I think the only thing I'd add is that it, it can sound very overwhelming, um, like Jennifer mentioned, but um, it's also a really cool process to sort of, you know, either early in your high school career or as you're doing your application to really reflect on this. And it can also be a really great learning opportunity just to kind of learn about yourself and reflect and figure out what really does um, make you unique and what really does make you excited and passionate. So try to think of it also, not just as the chore of applying to schools, but um, a great opportunity to really think deeply about what might be, you know, fun and exciting for you for the next few years. Great. All right, here's some stats from accepted students that um, colleges have released for the 2023 acceptance rounds. Um, anything notable here, Jennifer or Marina? It's very hard to get into these schools and um, you should not be down on yourself if, you know, if it doesn't happen. Um, I think I would just say when it comes to, to percentages like this, you know, ranging from four to 9%. Um, we also have to accept that some of it is outside of our control. Um, obviously, we can do our best, put our best foot forward, um, but also recognizing that we don't ever know exactly what um, each school wants for their class that year, exactly what spots they're looking to fill, and kind of maybe just taking it a little bit easy on ourselves um, in the process, which I know mm -hmm. And something that I would add is that as you look at the acceptance rates, those are the overall averages. Um, and one way to significantly boost your admission chances is to either select an early decision or a restrictive early action school um, where you're choosing one that's your top choice out of the schools that are listed here that you're going to submit an application for in November. 
depending on the school, it can go from these low single digit acceptance rates into the double digits, um, sometimes even approaching, you know, between 18 and 20 percent of applicants. Now, bear in mind that in the early round of an application, your applicant pool is going to be also extremely competitive. Um, but that is one way that students will strategize and work with their counselor at Quad to really determine the best um, approach that is going to make sense for that individual student, given your interests and your background, your skills, and where your scores are. As you're looking at this range of scores, the GPA is the average. For the SAT and the ACT, don't go in the middle of those two numbers and think that that's the 50% mark. So the way that you read the, that score range is that the lower number represents the ceiling, the top score, for the lower 25% of students who were admitted to that institution in that year. And the upper number represents the floor or the lowest score for the top 25%. So where you're aiming is as close to that top number as you can get if you're going to apply using your standardized testing scores. Um, or if you're in that neighborhood, your quad counselor may advise that you submit those scores as well. But it's important to understand the context for the range of the standardized testing scores that we're presenting. Great, that's really helpful. And I'm noticing that Dartmouth's average ACT score, there's a five instead of the dash, so that should be 33 to 36. Mm -hmm. um, apologies for that there. Um, but that's very helpful to know, especially when you're trying to decide where you want to apply and how you fit in um, to the student demographics. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's talk about tailoring your application strategy. And this is something that's important no matter where you're applying, but especially so for Ivy League schools. Marina, you want to take us away here? So um, there are a lot of different things to think about as you put together your application strategy and some things that help kind of get you in that mindset and thinking about, OK, is this really the right school for me? Um, is first starting really by looking into these schools and the differences between them. Um, so really doing your research on each school. Um, often we find people just want to apply to all of them. But the reality is that each school is really different and some schools may be a great fit for you, um, while others just wouldn't satisfy kind of what you're looking for in the next step of your life. And it is important to kind of look at that and understand the differences, not just um, for your own well-being and making sure that you are applying to schools that would be a good fit, that would support your strengths and help you develop on your weaknesses, but also because you will eventually have to write the why, you know, the school essay. And the more you can make a compelling argument about why it's a good fit, the better um, off you'll be. So what does that look like? Researching each school. Um, obviously, the schools have their websites. Um, social media presence, um, speaking with students who have gone there recently, either from your schools or your communities, talking to adults that have graduated um, from some of the schools and trying to understand from them what they perceive to be the critical pieces of their experiences. Um, really trying to understand what's not on the website um, is, a, is a great idea. And also, um, you know, if you have the opportunity to go visit, that's, that's always very helpful to be physically present. Um, the next piece is um, just thinking a, a little bit about yourself and what are your values and, and how do those compare to what you learned about each of the schools. Um, do you value, you know, a super flexible curriculum? You want to just like follow your heart and learn a little bit here, a little bit there. That's going to be one type of school. Um, do you need kind of a more rigid, structured um, program? Um, that's going to be another type of school. If you value a small local community, that'll be one type of school. If you value being in a big city that's very diverse, um, and where you're integrated into the community, that's obviously going to be a different type of school. So um, in that sense, right, looking at the things that are valuable to you, also understanding the, um, the things that you want to study and what each of those schools offer. 
When you put this all together, you want to really show how you and the school fit together. And you'll want to do that for all your essays, right? So a lot of times um, I'll see an essay about why, whatever, Harvard. And it'll be all about the things that Harvard has to offer. But Harvard kind of already knows what Harvard has to offer. Harvard wants to know why you um, and Harvard <laughs> fit together perfectly. Um, so some of that is going to be focusing on some of the unique offerings that the university has, um, whatever school it is that you're applying to has that are valuable to you. But part of it is also going to be connecting what you've done in your self-reflection process of this is really important to me. These are the experiences that I've had that have taught me that. And that's why we're a good fit. Um, and so working together to create that story is going to mean you're piecing together different elements. We've talked about like the academic piece. We're going to piece together your academics with your extracurriculars and making sure all of that kind of comes together in this story that makes you a very memorable standout person. Um, so, for example, it won't be, um, you know, I did debate and I did... Um, you know, cross country and I got all A's and now I want to go be a doctor, right? Um, we want to kind of figure out how do all of those things work together? And maybe you did do debate and maybe you did do cross country and all those things. And maybe that does have a path to being a doctor, but you have to find the specifics of those stories, um, the values you learn from each of those activities that have shown you that you want to be a doctor and that you would be good at being a doctor and that you would be a unique doctor. Um, so really figuring out that way to tell like a very, um, a story where all the pieces kind of just feel like they fit together like a puzzle, um, just like in this feature. Yeah, and Jennifer, anything you'd like to add? What, what knowledge? No, I think that's great. All right. We have some more things to talk about with tailoring your application strategy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. As Marina mentioned, you're going to be discussing your extracurricular activities. And again, you're focusing on a few that are very meaningful to you um, and can really highlight uh, how you've developed as a person, your unique strengths, what you're going to be able to bring to the campus. And um, also sort of thinking through what makes you you what makes you unique um, as you're as you're deciding what you want to pursue in high school and then as you're deciding what you want to really be highlighting and talking about um, in the college application process and then as you're writing those essays that's really the opportunity that you have to show um, in a lot of detail where you get your inspiration from and what you're going to be um, envisioning for your own path forward. You want to be um, working very carefully with your counselor to to craft very strong narratives there. Um, we have lots of experience with really what works at each institution and can help guide you um, in that way. And you want to make sure that it really carries your, your voice um, and your sense of like an authenticity um, as you're writing. A lot of my seniors now whom I'm working with are, you know, looking for the perfect, what's the, what are they looking for? What, you know, what should I do with my personal statement? And really it is that opportunity, if you had 10 minutes to sit down with someone from the institution, what would you want them to know about you at the end of that conversation? And then we want to think together creatively about ways that we can bring that story to life and really um, tell it in an engaging way that keeps your reader um, excited to learn more as you're going through your narrative. Um, you're going to have essays that are required by the institution that are called supplemental essays that are specific um, to the school. And as we saw this year, they're specific to the year. They change from year to year. They're not always constant. And this year they changed quite a bit. So um, you will be given the opportunity, as Marina said, to articulate that match and that fit between you and the institution. Because they're the expert in themselves, you're the expert in you, and it's part of your task to describe the ways that you would make use of the resources that are available academically and extracurricularly 
to fulfill your own goals and ambitions for your time in college and beyond. And then you want to be not forgetting your resume, your LinkedIn presence, and all of those good things that show um, what you've been doing with the time um, that you have had outside of class, um, either to pursue uh, work or internship opportunities, research opportunities, depending on your field of study, um, and then any of the other meaningful activities that you may have been engaged in, you're going to be wanting to highlight that in the best way possible in your resume. And lastly, if there are any um, weaknesses or any gaps, as many students going through the application cycle this year are, were, you know, in entering high school during the pandemic when everything was virtual and many students didn't learn well in that environment. So the applications do give you a space to discuss the impact that any sorts of global or very personal circumstances and challenges um, that you may have faced, what kind of an impact that had on your learning. You may have taken some time away for, from school for various reasons. You may have changed schools once, twice, more depending on circumstances either within your control or outside of your control. And you'll have an opportunity to address all of those um, additional factors in the application process. Great. Marina, anything else here before we move on to the next slide? Um, no, I think the only thing that, that really like um, I wanted to emphasize even more is what um, Amber mentioned about like showing yourself um, because that is really important. Like show, make sure that they can actually imagine it. Um, don't, you know, just in your essays in particular, right? Like don't just tell, we're not just telling people I value X. We really need to give them examples and details so that they actually believe it. Um, there's a big difference between saying, um, you know, I'm community oriented and then giving examples and really bringing that to life. Absolutely. I think that's definitely a point we drive home on a lot of these um, and is just essential, an essential piece of your application materials. All right. So let's talk a little bit about choosing activities and also displaying academic excellence. Marina, being, do you want to take this one? Uh, sure. Um, yeah, so um, in terms of activities, there are often kind of questions about what, what are the right activities, how many do I do, do how many hours of this do I need, et cetera. Um, and really, I think it's helpful to think about it in, in these three pieces, right? Like, what are the right extracurricular activities? And um, I think often the best way to really think about it is what what do you actually enjoy? What brings you joy? What do you think you can pursue and um, doesn't feel like a chore? Because usually if you're doing something that you enjoy or you're getting a lot out of it, um, it just makes the whole process a lot easier, right? Like you don't have to select, you don't have to go be in the student government just because you think that's like the activity that the school wants to see on your resume. You don't have to, you know, be on the soccer team because that's the activity the school wants to see on your resume. Um, I mean, these are all great activities. And if you're doing that, that's great if they bring you joy and, and you have passion in them. Um, but the important thing is finding something where you can really, well, and especially, you know, when you're younger, explore different things, see what you like. As you get into high school and you kind of have more of a sense for that, um, I think one thing that's really important is picking something that you can kind of stick to and grow with. Um, in sort of skipping ahead to this like pursuing leadership roles piece. Um, but it is really important for the schools to see that you're not just like a passive participant in a bunch of different activities. What they'll want to see is that you have actually really contributed to that activity, somehow like grown it at the school or done something unique with it that not everybody could have done. Um, also, um, looking at, um, it's not about having like 10 different things that you're involved in, but really having just a few that you have made a really solid quality contribution to. What the schools wanna see is that you have proven yourself to be successful in the past 
you have proven yourself to be able to take on um, leadership opportunities. You've proven yourself to be proactive. Um, so a really good way to demonstrate that is through your extracurricular activities. Are you saying that you don't have to do an extracurricular and like every cat, you don't have to do a sport and an instrument and um, a math club and acting. You can pick a couple and stick to what you're passionate about. Yeah, I think that that is definitely the, the takeaway there. And I, I do think that it is good to show that you have some differences in interests, right? Like, you're not just like entirely only focused on one thing, um, but it's okay if you're very passionate about one thing and a lot of what you do is around that. Um, but then maybe just showing like a different side to you, right? Like people who are really into science can have a creative artistic side or can be really interested in like a club sport. That, that's great and shows a little bit of versatility, but you don't have to do it just to um, check the box. Right. I think that's something we get a lot of students thinking they need to check a box in every um, extracurricular category when that's not necessarily something that you need to do. Jennifer, anything else here? Um, I would just say that, you know, many of the um, Ivy League schools are looking for uh, national, if not international level recognition in a certain area. So, um, you know, whether it's chess is your passion and you're involved in competitions or you thrive on the model UN scene or speech and debate in music, in athletics, whatever your chosen uh, an area of giftedness is, is that you want to grow and develop. Um, you want to be thinking about ways that you can pursue excellence in that area and how it would be recognized um, and awarded um, because many of your peers that you'll be competing against will have pretty impressive records in that area. And so the way that you think about doing that if you're just getting started is, you know, what do I love doing? What am I gifted at? What do people always, you know, think of when they think of me? Um, and how can I really make a difference and, and grow those skills? And you can't do that and pursue that one area of excellence, maybe two areas of excellence, um, while you're doing a whole bunch of other different things and also getting great grades and sleeping well and taking care of your physical and mental health, which is so important. So um, that's part of the sort of the overriding background um, for why we're encouraging you in this direction. Great. All right. So a little bit more with extracurriculars and also academic achievements. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As I was mentioning, um, looking at community service and volunteering is um, an area where, you know, you have to do that as part of your high school curriculum, um, whether it's, you know, your hours for graduation or um, part of an honor society that you're a part of or what have you. But it's more than that, too. If you're, for example, if you're going to be um, thinking about a law career, um, you can get in, involved in legal aid clinics and help those that, that need access and support um, to legal advice. And you get to know practitioners in your area who are also um, oriented towards doing pro bono work in that regard. And then you can, might be able to build connections. Um, and all the while you're helping those in your community who need it. Some of my students who are STEM or uh, CS interested, and they'll get involved with tutoring and helping under-resourced schools in their area to fundraise for equipment and then to provide training for the students so that they can really grow and address some of the gaps um, that exist in our society. And then they write about that and why they chose to devote uh, sometimes a whole lot of time, effort, and energy in this area. Some students will find, found a nonprofit um, of their own to take on, uh, you know, a certain cause that's important to them, like what I'm describing. So you want to be mindful of the location where you are, the needs that your community has, and how you might be able to make a difference in a way that aligns with your overall goals and um, your overall skills and talents. Then um, again, as I mentioned before, you wanna be looking at ways to highlight your academic excellence, both through the you know, 
standard ways of looking at your GPA and how you're doing um, in your academics overall, but also ways that you've taken on opportunities outside of your school to grow intellectually, whether it's through research, you can be doing independent work. Some of my students are writing books, um, either in their field of study or in a, in a fiction capacity or poetry, whatever their, their passion is. And thinking about how you can really engage in those areas and show that you're committed. It's one thing to say, I really want to be a doctor. It's another thing to say, I've spent 200 hours over the past year volunteering at the Red Cross blood drives and at my local hospital um, to provide service to people who need it and to help uh, my community in these areas. So you wanna be able to demonstrate um, how those areas are kind of cohering and coming together. And um, if your school, for example, maybe um, doesn't offer a language that you're interested in studying or another subject that you're really interested in studying, don't let that deter you because there are lots of ways that you can pursue that either during the academic year or during the summer and really um, demonstrate that you were so interested in this field that you took it upon yourself to show the initiative um, and find a way to study it even if it meant enrolling in outside coursework. Great. Marina, anything else here? No, that, that was great. Makes me wanna apply to college again and now having your good advice. <laughs> All right, and the last few things here. Yeah, I can, I can touch on these. Um, so, of course, your GPA um, is going to be a critical component um, and standardized test scores where they're um, taken into consideration. Um, so those are things that you always want to, to do your best at, right? Always try to do your best with, with the academic piece. Um, and I just really encourage um, students to um, do their best to pursue their passions and everything, but also to remember that academics are the base and that they, they should always be the priority. Um, you could be really great at um, whatever it is that is your unique challenge, and that is going to help a lot, but you have to have the academics too um, to, to just make sure that the school knows that you're going to be able to be successful there. Um, I also think about this just in the context of with those admissions rates being so um, competitive. <laughs> um, academics are always going to be a great like thing to have, right? If you don't get into one of these schools, um, the academics will allow you to get into a lot of other schools and will be really critical to that. And then there's always opportunities for transferring or graduate school, but academics will live forever. You're gonna have them in your graduate applications too. So just don't neglect those. I think with that, this is a great time to mention that the Ivy League are just a handful of schools and there's many mm -hmm. other schools that have as good um, academics and where you will get an incredible, incredible education and all of these tips can translate to those as well. And if you don't get into an Ivy, there's a lot of other places for you that are just as good. All right, so let's go over some tips to elevate your application documents, and then we'll open things up for a Q&A. So some of these we've covered a little bit, um, but this is a little bit more detail. Yeah, so as you're, um working on your essays, both your personal essay um, and your supplemental documents, you wanna keep in mind your voice. Um, what is the most important aspect of yourself that you want to make sure stands out and comes across? Um, you wanna think about the admissions officer who's reading hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of files and what can you share that's going to make your application really stick with someone? Um, in a unique and compelling way. So that's um, some of the guidance that we, we encourage you to think about here. And while you're working on your essay, um, 
you're going to be sharing it with a few people. Your parents are probably going to want to read it. You're, you might be working on it in your English class. You'll definitely be working on it with your uh, admissions counselor. And we advise that you not show it to too many people, then it starts to get confusing. You get all kinds of feedback and can almost feel like you're going in circles. But you do want to make sure that you get some trusted additional readers to give you some perspective on your writing um, and let you know how it feels from their point of view to be reading your essay and what they have questions about, what you might be able to articulate a little bit more smoothly or more clearly. And along those lines, we also want to be um, encouraging you to select those compelling topics um, that, again, are going to really convey your unique story. All right, letters of recommendation. So um, letters of recommendation can be very standout, um, especially if you kind of prepare properly. Um, and that takes a lot of forward thinking, right? You, you're going to want to find um, and even be very intentional in your high school career around building relationships with um, teachers and, and staff that can vouch for you um, and making sure you're being just very intentional about the way that you are interacting with those people, how you're showing um, your skills, how you're showing yourself to be proactive, how you're showing up in class. Um, so really be um, be good about thinking about that in advance, right? You don't want to get to the point where you're thinking, who can I ask for a recommendation? I didn't participate very much in these classes. I'll, I'll just speak for myself. I was a very quiet student in high school and I did not like to raise my hand. I did not like to participate. And this was very difficult for me because while I did well in my classes, probably a lot of my teachers didn't remember me because I was a very quiet student. Um, so try to, if, if you're like me at all in that regard, um, at least pick a couple of classes to be a little bit more actively engaged in some teachers that you feel like you could connect with um, and see if you can help them or TA or um, contribute in some way. Um, and you can provide them with some guidance um, as you kind of think about what your strategy is and you decide, you know, these are the three things that I want the, the schools to know about me. You want to create sort of a brag sheet that highlights those things, your resume that highlights um, those things to your recommenders so that they can help to support your story. Okay, we want them to be layering on an extra layer of like knowledge and detail about you and not just talking about something totally random or very generic that could apply to any student. Um, so this is an important part you can stand out as well. Absolutely. And you, you are, um, you're always going to be providing um, two letters of reference for Ivy Plus, Ivy League schools. And some schools are going to give you an opportunity to provide additional letters of reference. So um, some of my students who have done independent research with a, a faculty member at an institution, maybe the institution they're applying to or another impressive school will have a letter from that research supervisor. Um, you may have um, someone from an internship that you've done provide a letter. There are even opportunities for coaches and family members to provide letters. And you want to use those judiciously if you think they're going to be able to add something that your teachers are not going to be able to, to provide from um, people who've known you in a different context. Great. In a webinar we had a couple weeks ago, one of our panelists was telling us that at a school he worked at, someone submitted 27 letters of recommendation and it's recommended that if you have extras you're allowed to submit more a handful is fine but you don't don't need to go to that extreme level because at that point you're not going to be learning anything else in them that isn't already stated in others all right so we talked about resumes earlier um, we'll touch on this briefly Yeah, so here again, you're, um, you're just wanting to be very organized and clear and highlight both your academic honors and achievements, your leadership role, 
roles that you've had, um, any relevant work or internship or research experiences, and the the key extracurricular activities. It may not be every single extracurricular that you've done in high school, um, but some of the main ones. And um, there are various approaches that work for each school that your counselor um, can help you with in that regard. And we touched on this as well, but um, as you think about um, majors, careers, you want to really show the classes that you've taken that are related to that. And um, you want to think about also it had other um, internships that have helped to support that. Even like shadowing someone for a short period of time is helpful and internship, figuring out if you can contribute to a project somewhere that's um, that's related, just really showing that you actually understand a little bit about that field, which is gonna be very difficult in your high school years to, to get a good sense for what your future career might look like. Um, but showing that you've tried to find those experiences and those opportunities to get some exposure is very helpful. Um, and I will just say that I think it can be overwhelming to think like, oh, I'm 17 years old and I have to know what I wanna do. And I think that's okay. Um, the only way you can find out what you want to do is to try different things. Um, so look at it with that perspective. You know, I went to school thinking I was going to do one thing. I've changed careers a dozen times. Um, not, not a dozen, but even, you know, everyone, not everyone, but many people change careers and that's okay. Um, you're trying things out and seeing what fits, but you got to actually learn from like a real experience. All right. I know we've we'll, touched on this a few times. Take it away, Jennifer. Yeah, we'll, we'll end where we began, um, applying early and the value of that. So there are, are two ways um, for the Ivy League and the Ivy Plus schools um, as well to structure the early application process. So um, the early decision process is um, whereby you select one school and you actually sign a contract and your parents are asked on the Common App to um, indicate that they understand that you are doing this and they are supportive of your decision um, to attend this school if you are admitted to this school. It makes the enrollment management um, aspect of admissions at universities very straightforward for schools and it's a very um, popular way for schools to ascertain your interest, they know that you're committed to coming, and they know that if they admit one student, one student's going to come. I also want to touch on, and this does boost your admissions chances, as I mentioned in the chart um, that we were reviewing earlier. I also want to mention the restrictive early admission program, which is a slight variation on ED that is offered by Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford, and some other schools. Um, where it's still the November 1st deadline, you can only select that one institution's restrictive early action program. The difference is that you don't have to decide right away. Um, you're not going to be locked into attending that school if you're admitted. You can still let other application decisions come from other means, um, early action programs that are non-binding, regular decision um, application deadlines that are non-binding, and then you can make a decision in May. So um, it's important to know the nuances and we can help you understand and coach you through what's best for you. Great. All right, that takes us to our Q&A. Um, so if you have any questions, pop them in the chat. And again, this is being recorded. You will be sent um, a recording of this webinar within a few days. Um, so let's see, one question we have is, is being an Eagle Scout a big advantage over other extracurriculars? I personally love it when I get to work with a student who has demonstrated the commitment and the perseverance necessary um, to advance all the way through the scouting ranks to Eagle Scouts. It makes for a great compelling um, essay about their motivation and their dedication to that, the skills that they've learned, the leadership opportunities they've been able to achieve. Um, so I think it makes for a really compelling uh, addition to your portfolio. Great. 
All right. And then how important is class rank when your GPA is pretty good? That one, but you, you so it's better. yeah the higher the better um some of the more selective um high schools more competitive high schools and and many others are starting to move away from class ranking um so it's not uh, necessarily what it once was so don't um don't be too concerned if you know a lot of students in your in your school have a very high gpa and so you can't all be at the very top of the list. It's sort of like the US News and World Report rankings where the five schools are tied for third on the list. It's that kind of a thing. Um, the most important thing is that your academics reflect your own commitment and that you really have um, leveraged your school's resources and beyond in the community um, and, and in online learning to really avail yourself of academic rigor and push yourself to take the most demanding courses that you can, focusing on that area of interest. Great. All right. Um, all right, this is a great question about early action and decision. So what if you feel like you're not fully ready to send in your applications? Mm -hmm. um, should you apply regular decision or should you push to apply early if you're not, you don't feel like your application is quite there and you would benefit from some more time? Obviously, this is going to be case by case specific um, and it will depend on your circumstances. But do either of you have a general rule that you go by? We were actually just chatting about this a little bit um, before, before the call started. Um, my take on it is that it is good to get the opinion of um, a counselor at that stage to see how ready it is um, and how much work has to be done to get it to like the best it can be. Um, if you're pretty close, then I think it may be worth, worth, worth the push, especially if it's for one school. Um, but I would not suggest that someone try to get all of their applications in early just to get it over with, um, especially if it's if it's ushed. The, the importance of having a good quality application is, is gonna be like much more of a game changer than when you apply. And I'm just gonna um, grab my battery. My computer is doing something very strange. <laughs> no worries. And um, I would add to that um, excellent description that Marina provided that for early action, those are the ones you can punt. It doesn't give you an advantage. Um, it's just the advantage is that you know sooner rather than later. But if you are under a time crunch and you feel like um, you're, you're just not going to get there, you prioritize an early application school that has a scholarship deadline attached to it, like USC and other institutions, where if you don't apply early, you're going to miss consideration for that merit scholarship. Um, that's an important sort of distinguishing factor. But outside of that, if it's just a matter of convenience for you finding out early and you don't feel like the application is at its best, push that off to regular decision. Um, in contrast with the early decision um, applications and the REA uh, application process that I outlined, you're facing um, not only nationwide competition, but competition from within your school. So if you um, are attending a school, you know that, you know, last year there were a couple of students admitted to this Ivy and that Ivy and this Ivy Plus. The school is not going to bring in seven students from your high school to Yale. And if there are, if there's a, really a school that you have your heart set on, you need to get in that early decision or restrictive early action pool and I would do, I would advise that you really push yourself to accomplish that goal because you might get shut out even at the school level if you wait until the January round when students from your school have already been accepted in the November round. That's a great thing to take into consideration that we don't talk about a lot. Um, and then a couple other quick questions on early action, early decision. Um, for early, for restricted, Restrictive early action, can you only apply regular decision to other schools or can you also apply to other early actions? 
That's a great question. And each school has its own fine print. Um, and so it's very important to be very, and do a very nuanced read with your counselor um, of what exactly you're allowed to do and not do, because if you cross the line, then you'll render your, your restrictive early action application null and void. Um, so you wanna be very careful about that. Some of the institutions make the provision that I um, outlined that if you need to do a non-binding early program, uh, early application in order to be considered for a scholarship program, right? So there's three things there to pay attention to, um, then those may be allowed depending on the institution. But you're not allowed to do any other binding early program, such as an early decision program. Great. Um, and then demerit, do you you might not know this, um, and we can find out and follow up after. If not, do merit scholarships differ between early decision and early action? Well, that's a, that's an interesting question, but very, very, very few schools offer both an early decision and an early uh, early decision and an early action program. So um, if you're asking about generalities between institutions, that's, I think, a, a topic or a question that's um, difficult to, to answer concretely um, because there's so many variables involved. Great. Um. I do want to note with the early decision program um, that while you are signing a contract that you will attend if you are accepted there is a caveat that if you need financial aid to attend the institution and you're applying for financial aid to attend the institution and the financial aid package that you are awarded is not sufficient for you to be able to attend the institution that is the one um, circumstance through which you are able to decline although it would be a very sad state of affairs if you needed to do that you would be released from the binding aspect of your early decision application if your financial aid does not come through at that school. Great. Um, all right, here's another great question, especially with this topic. Um, and I will also say we do have a webinar that we did last week on this, and you can find that on our website where we go in depth. But what if there are similar people in the application pool doing similar activities as you? How does the Ivy institution differentiate and pick a student out? And again, we do have a full webinar on this where we go into detail, but I'm gonna let Jennifer and Marina answer here as well. <laughs> my, my favorite. My favorite illustration is um, pick your musical instrument that's unusual. Mine is usually the trombone um, that, you know, there were two pre-med candidates, both had amazing skills. The, uh, the orchestra really needed that year this one particular instrument and they didn't really need this other one particular instrument or the sports team had reached their quota with, um, you know, the crew, the, the crew team had their max. And so it can come down to these very unpredictable, nuanced aspects of your background that it's impossible to prep for. Um, some of some of these uh, decisions are are made um, along those kinds of lines in in the final analysis. I think that's definitely what we talked a lot about in the webinar. And unfortunately, you know, at the end of the day, there's going to be tons of candidates that are very qualified to get into the school, but they can only take so many applicants. So it's luck of the draw at that point. And depending on what the admissions committee is looking for to build their class of that year, it'll, exactly. it'll differ, which unfortunately it's not necessarily fair, but it's the way the system works. And just that one more reminder, of, um, as important as this all feels, this is not a reflection of your worth. Um, and hopefully you can also think about those activities as not just like a path to get to an Ivy League school. But again, that's why we say, please like do things that you enjoy and that you love and that help you grow. Um, because then you're getting something out of it too, right? And, and that's the way that you're gonna get better at it as well. Great. All right. So. 
we still have some questions in our queue here and unfortunately won't be able to get to all of them today. Please feel free to reach out to us on our website and you can set a meeting with us so we can um, help you figure out what you need, especially as you're getting into crunch time for applications here. And I just want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. It was a pleasure to have you all. Jennifer, Marina, thank you both so much for being here and through for all of this information. Good luck with your applications if you're applying soon and if you have another year or so. Good luck with, um, you know, getting starting to get things together, figuring out where you want to apply in that entire journey. I hope everyone has a really great rest of their night.